November is just around the corner, and that means the 16th Annual National Podcast Post Month is fast approaching. Hi, I'm Jennifer Navarrete, founder of NAPPOD POMO, and I'm inviting you to join the 30-Day Global Podcasting Challenge. Whether you're a newbie looking to start your first podcast or a seasoned pro seeking inspiration, NAPPOD POMO is the perfect place to experiment and try new things. Visit NAPPODPOMO.org to learn more. See where podcasting can take you this November during National Podcast Post Month. And, you know, another theme of the book that is sort of a sub, sub, sub theme is art. You know, I'm always inadvertently, I think, writing about art because I was an artist and I still hang around uh, with uh, a lot of the artists that I knew in the Midwest and in fact, I hope to take a trip up there. I have a book event in Chicago, and so I'm excited about being there again. But it, um, Will is has taken off wood carving just out of idleness, I think, and because he he collects like old those old. The, the story takes place on a place at a place called Boneyard Beach, and it, that actually is a real island down there. I looked, and um, it's. Uh, you know, the bones, the trees that fall and wash into the ocean and then wash back up on the shore are sort of called, uh, you know, there's a beach called the Boneyard. And so he he goes around and chainsaws those up and does stuff with them. And, and he actually sells his art once in a while at a little market down in the, um, in the town. So, uh, you know, that comes straight from my memories of doing art shows and stuff. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. So glad to have you here with us. Yet another amazing author joining us today. Um, and excited to have Betty Joyce Nash on with me today to talk about her journey as an author. Lots of great things to talk about. And uh, I'm, I'm always excited to have another great author on the podcast. So Betty Joyce, welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you here. Welcome, welcome. Well, it's great to be here. I've been looking forward to it. It's great to have you here. Can you let everybody know where you are in this great big world of ours? Okay. I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is uh, just in the, I would say, very close to the Shenandoah National Park, about 15 miles from there. And Mm. um, it's a lovely place. So for someone who has never been there, what am I missing out on? What should I see if I was ever to come and and visit your, your area of the world? Well, a lot of people focus on the presidential site. I'm an outdoors woman, so I, I love to get over and uh, hike in the park. And um, there are uh, any number of hikes uh, available to any level of hiker. And so it's it's fun just to get out. I have a meetup group. You know, I'm in, in a meetup group and we meet and just hike the, the whole park. It's only about, you know, a half hour drive park the car and go hike for a whole day. It's really wonderful. And there typically are waterfalls everywhere, but not this summer. It's very dry. Well, here where I live, we have one really big waterfall kind of <laughs> called Niagara Falls. Yeah. And it's always, it's always going. So, um, but yeah, that's beautiful. Sounds like a beautiful place to visit. I would love to come sometime. So great. I'm looking forward to that. Um, talk a little bit about your author journey, how you got started. I um, always like to kind of know how this all began for you as an author. Well, that's a little bit fun to talk about because I never was one of, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I've been writing stories since I was five years old, that kind of thing. But but I really didn't. I mean, I think I did write, you know, as most uh, children do early elementary school, but I always have been an avid reader. I remember my sister checking out books from the um you know, upper grade uh, part of the library. So even in third grade, I was reading Tom Sawyer and books like that, that I didn't, couldn't fully appreciate, but I could read the words. But that um, said, I was a visual artist first. I studied English and art in college, and then I became a potter. And I literally um, inched my way up there. I, I studied at Penland School, which is a craft school in the mountains of North Carolina. I studied with a couple of pretty well-known artists and and struck out on my own. And um, at the time, I was living in Milwaukee, and I established a studio there. And um, 
I made my living that way for about 10 years. Eventually, after about five years, I moved to Chicago because the market there was was thriving and it was there were just so many more people that sales were much better. And I was part of a group studio there that's still around. And so that really taught me the value of it. it it's a very hard way to make a living, but it's it's rewarding. You know, I mean, I literally did everything from make the clay in an old dough mixer to um you know, to uh, firing it in a kiln that I built myself. And you're looking at somebody who has absolutely no engineering skills. And so I just read books and got people to help me. And I even built my own burners because, of course, I didn't have much money. And um, it, you know, it, it really just taught me the value of, well, really, if you can do that, you can do anything. And so um, at, at some point, though, like in my um late thirties, I, I was actually making my living. It wasn't a lot more than just a living. And I just started getting a little bit worried about my financial future. And so I decided to add another skill to my toolbox. And I went to, I was living not far from Evanston where Northwestern University is, and they have a master's in journalism. And I applied and got into that program. And then, and I, I got out and I immediately got a job as a reporter. And um, most people don't really see the similarities between writing and play, but they're there. I mean, you're producing, especially if you're a reporter, you're producing a product. Like I would make mugs and bowls and I would be producing a product. You know, every day I would leave the newsroom and go out into the community and cover something and come back and create something from it. And um, that whole process is rewarding to me. And it still is, you know, whether a short story or a novel. But I will say that novel writing, and we'll get into this some more later on in a deeper way, but it is kind of like riding a Bronco or something. It was a whole different experience than writing and writing essays. You know, I started just by writing personal essays that occasionally I got published, like in Christian Science Monitor or someplace like that, just short pieces, six or 800 words about my experience of doing something or not doing something. And that was pretty gratifying. But then later to get into short stories are particularly difficult. And then a novel, you know, that just kind of blew me away, but it's a valuable process in ways that you almost can't quantify, you know, in a logical fashion. But that's the short version. (laughs) Nice. I'm always curious about how someone can take one skill set and then bring that to their author journey and the things that transfer over that make you unique as an author because of what you know outside of writing right? that you bring. It, it makes you unique and creative and different than other authors who don't have the background that you have. Right. So what are, what are some of your superpowers then that you have as an author? Well, um, I don't know that I have any real superpowers, but um, like I, I was saying, just that um, ability to just keep uh, going you know, is yeah. so important in any um, in any skill that you're trying to make a name for yourself. You're creating a product, essentially, and just to keep going, you know, because you have to finish. Once you start, you can't not finish a novel. There were so many times when I just thought, well, why don't I just lay this down and forget about it? <laughs> but hmm. you really can't do that. So that's the number one skill is just the perseverance. And I would say that's probably just about all you need. It's just that the process itself keeps you going. Time as a full-time potter, I could do almost anything with the clay and it would forgive me because I knew how to treat it. And, you know, words aren't quite that um, easily tamed because there's always something new you can do with your words. And now it's such a refreshing time to be working because hybrid genres, I mean, just almost anything goes, you can get out there and there are small publishers cropping up everywhere. And, um, you know, they want to see work that breaks the rules. They want to see work that uh, transcends a tradition. And it's, it's really exciting. It's an exciting time to be, to be working. And going back. Yeah. And going back to like taking something like clay, which is formless and has no purpose in its current form, and then making it into something that's usable, beautiful, 
Like that's a there's a lot of work in there, and I kind of th- see that in in writing. You take a bunch of words, and you're like, well, "This makes no sense," but then crafting that into something that creates story and brings people in. There's just a nice synergy between the two, I think. There is, and it feels like uh, making something from nothing, right? Because the words are just there randomly, and you're picking them. Who knows where they're coming from? And uh, yeah, it is. It is really both. Uh, skills, I guess, for lack of a better word, are sort of, um, you know, exciting, magical. So talk more about what you're currently working on. There's a book coming out. Um, Give us some insight around the title of the book and a little bit more about what's in there for us as readers. Okay, It is the story of um, an unlikely friendship between a misanthropic veteran who um, uh, is unwittingly and unwillingly uh, sort of in charge by his own, um, well, uh, I guess he just feels obligated because he's ex-military and these children um, ranging in age from five to the oldest who is the boss of the clan. Um, She is 13. Her name is Lucille. And she is put in charge. Her mother relies on her as a lot of single mothers do for um, child care and other, um, you know, responsibilities that are really sort of outside of her um, age range. But she does it because she always has done it. And her father actually was killed in the Iraq war. Also, they live in the Midwest and her mother is troubled Her mother is still grieving after 10 years, but on top of that, she is a single mother. She works hard all the time. She's a nurse, and um, she gets together with an old boyfriend because she was raised in this area, this beach area, and um, she uh, takes off with them for a couple of days, and she just tells her daughter, look, I'll be back in a couple of days. Don't worry. And, um, but of course the daughter does worry and the veteran sees this happening and doesn't really know the full story until Lucille, uh, tells him one day, but they develop this unlikely, um, relationship and, uh, he sort of, you know, he's been a hermit for 10 years since he's been out of the service. And so he, uh, yeah, he just steps up to the plate and even though Lucille doesn't want him to, you know, he kind of is there for them. And, you know, it's a lot more complicated like that than than that because, you know, they end up um, with, uh, you know, some a crisis in which, uh, you know, the whole community kind of comes together. And it's a very small community loosely based on a, an island off the coast of Georgia and where the uh, earliest... Um, inhabitants were uh, were slaves uh, of um, the plantation owners down there. And so that's where the title comes from, because Will, he grew up um, in the marsh uh, uh, on that island. There's the beach side, the beachfront ecology down there is generally the beach side, you know, with the nice, beautiful uh, sand and the ocean. And then there's the tidal waters and then across you know then on the other side of that is the marsh and that's where his house is that's where he grew up and he's always saying oh everybody down here is related to everybody else because lucille will say things like oh who's that and she'll say he'll say oh oh, i don't know probably second third cousin two or three times removed i don't know what that means but everybody down here and so that um the title sort of suggested itself to me but in the end you know they have this kind of makeshift family. And um, I, you know, I hope that's not too much of a spoiler alert, but, but they have to go a long way to get there. And I think uh, the two main characters especially learn something, but, you know, even at the end, you know, everything is, is not perfect, but it's um, definitely things have shifted. The characters perspectives have shifted. So tell me how you, developed these two main characters did did they kind of come to you at the same time or was there one character you focused on at first and the story kind of built off that how did you how did you determine your first two main characters no i think my first character was lucille i'm fascinated by these uh 
while young people today, uh, I have two grown sons, 30 and 32, and I'm just fascinated by how how smart and capable they are. And um, and actually, in my family, I come from a family of three, and my mother always worked. We were, in a sense, latchkey kids. She was always the boss, but you know, there were times in the summers when you know she had to work every day. And so um, we sort of had that structure of the oldest looking after, you know, and I was in the middle, but I, I just always, I found that idea really fascinating of these. And there are lots of characters like this in literature um, where, you know, you have this uh, early adolescent who's really quite capable, maybe even more so than the grownups they're coming into contact with because they see the world uh, and Lucille, by the way, and this is a theme in the book, it's almost a climate fiction book, this new genre of cli-fi, because she is obsessed, literally, with uh, global warming. And she just can't believe that everybody down there is not just going crazy because, and she keeps saying, look, look, everybody, it's just going to be gone. And um, and she's just so frustrated because people, in her mind, aren't doing anything. And so... Um, you know, you just look around at young people today and they know so much more than I feel like I did growing up. And they're so passionate about everything. And she kind of came to me first. And um, then eventually I gave them each a point of view, um, which is a little unusual. I could talk about point of view for a moment because mm -hmm. it's um, I actually am telling Lucille's story from a first person perspective. And for any writers out there, you know that first person is about the most intimate uh, perspective there is. You're, you really are, if you're in close first, you really are that person. You know, you, the author really is the person and, um, and you're, you're in their skin. And then I, and then Will's perspective, I decided to drop back and tell his uh, story in third person, which gave me a little more distance from him. He's older, and he's a, a man. And it's not difficult for a woman to write from her perspective of a man, but it's, you know, I, I just wanted to um, just give him a little bit more distance because he is distant. He's He lives on a barrier island. That's why he manages a motel that his friend owns because he doesn't want any contact with people. And then these kids kind of show up almost on his doorstep and sort of force him into change. See, no, that's, that's interesting. And you said cli-fi? Cli is that what you said? Yeah, like, I'm like, is it, did you create a new word? I haven't never heard somebody say that before. I've been using it as a hashtag, but I don't, but it does, it's not, you know, when sometimes when you do Twitter, they'll, if you use a hashtag that everybody uses, it'll show up blue and cli-fi never shows up blue. So I don't think it's really that, Accepted, but I have seen it in print. I did not invent it, but it's like CLI hyphen FI. And I kind of, <laughs> is it, it's true, you know, you can't, you almost, an author almost cannot avoid writing about what is happening in the world if the story is taking place in, you know, the, where are we in the, you know, early part of the, still, I guess, the first couple of decades of. The um, and we've known about climate change for a long time. Yeah, so. right. It, okay, so from your perspective, are you? Did you write yourself into the story? Are you in there? These characters at all? You know, I, I I'm sure I am. I mean, I'm sure I'm in all, in all the characters I write a little bit. I don't see how an author could really um, avoid it. And and it would be now that you're mentioning that. I just started sort of chiding myself, thinking, you know, it would really be challenging for you to write somebody who's really, really different. For example, somebody who, you know, um, hates environmental legislation <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, so it would be really challenging to write somebody completely different from myself. I, I'm going to try that. I'm glad that See, and that's the thing about relying on surprises. And when you write a novel, you're going to be surprised a lot at what happens. But um, but like this interview, you know, that surprises me that I had that insight just when I was talking to you. So, yeah. See, and that's why we do these things. And I love I love having conversations with authors. It's so creative and special. And I'm all, I'm just I'm thrilled to talk to authors. I, I learn so much by having this podcast. So. I'm excited having you on. Um, so for for readers, then 
who would this who would this book be perfect for if I was going to give a gift to a family member or a friend and I'm thinking about gifting your book to someone who who would be the perfect person that would love to get a copy of this book you know I think almost anyone would enjoy it almost any age too you know because certainly um you know an adolescent it deals with a lot of um that are familiar to all of us. All of us have experienced loss and many of us can't help. Uh, I would say we all have wounds of one kind and another by the time you're even, you know, Lucille has extra wounds probably because of her father's death and her mother's troubles, which include, um, you know, problems with her job. That's one of the reasons that are down there. She's on an indefinite leave from the job and Lucille isn't exactly sure why. But yeah, it's, uh, I, I think it's good for almost any age over like the age of, I don't know, look at what 12 year olds read. I mean, they read widely in a lot of, I mean, my children always did and so did I. So I think almost anybody would enjoy it any age and uh, especially who people who like novels, who, who like stories about characters who are troubled and they're going through life, you know, kind of. We all just kind of bumble through life, right? And we we learn as we go. And and there are a lot of interesting, you know, the minor characters in a novel are almost as interesting as uh, as the primary characters. You know, I have a few of the people on the island who uh, interest me, you know, an elderly woman who's lived there her whole life, and she has taken it upon herself to be the guardian of the sea turtles that nest every year there and of course they're endangered like uh, many other creatures and um so yeah yeah i think there's something for just about any reader a book club or yeah so i'm getting this undertone of climate and environmentalism this thing sounds like something that's really a, a passion of yours where does that passion come from and can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that kind of feeds into the story that you've written. It does. It's. I would say that might be the theme. You know, every novel has, um, of course, characters uh, acting and reacting. But every novel also usually has some sort of theme beyond, you know, what's going on with the characters. It doesn't have to be a major, um, uh, you know, like the environment or 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 but but this sort of encompasses a lot of sociological uh themes and um and you know I remember the first Earth Day and I remember what a big deal that was and that was in 1970 I think later I became an economics writer and um I did a lot of articles about the unintended consequences and costs uh true costs of environmental damage of air pollution, for example, it's very easy to trace the rise in respiratory disease um, to air pollution. And it, it, there's an immediate difference, you know, like when we got the wildfire smoke from Canada, you know, they're going right. to the, they're going to see that in the statistics immediately. People in ERs and 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 the costs are are huge. You know, environmental regulations. Contrary to some people's belief, actually more than pay for themselves. Anything that we pay to to implement those costs, um, more than pay for themselves by just by cutting down illness and death. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that all of us can can do better of is being better stewards of what we've been given. And this world is not ours to take advantage of, but it's ours to take care of. Yeah. Right? That's the big meaning, I think, that a lot of us need to understand our role in all of this. It's very important. So I'm hoping some of that comes through to people in a in a way that um, because uh, you know when you when you look at books that are about social problems, like for example, uh, I recently read Demon Copperhead, and probably you did too, and it really demonstrates the power of fiction because um, you know the opioid crisis was so terrible, but but when you and when you read articles, even good ones about the statistics and even that include personal stories, it doesn't have quite the power as investing in a character and seeing that character actually go through 
the motions of that crisis demonstrate everything that happened during that crisis. And the power of fiction is enormous. It's not, you know, it's not frivolous. Uh, Fiction is not a frivolous genre. It's every bit as important because it really draws a reader into a world and can actually change people's minds about things and show people things they didn't know before in a in a deeper at a deeper level you know because sometimes you can read the words but until you actually feel it Mm -hmm. it's different so now that the book is coming and we're going to be celebrating its release what are you excited about now at this stage now it's time to promote the book and get out there and and talk about the book and doing this is great i appreciate being here but what are you excited about now that you're at this stage of the writing process What's exciting for you as we look towards the next chapter? Yeah, name of my podcast. What are you looking forward to in the next chapter? Right, right. Well, I'm kind of, uh, well, I am excited to talk about the book like I'm talking about it with you because it, I get all excited all over again. And <laughs> I'm not, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, shy uh, about talking about the book until somebody like you, a talented interviewer, draws me out. But it, um, but it is fun to talk about it at this stage, and it's kind of sad to leave it behind. But I am working on a fictionalized um, memoir of my years in clay, which were were hard at first. And I was going through a divorce, and you know my marriage was crumbling. I was moving to the Midwest, where I'd never lived in a cold climate before, and that whole story is kind of interesting. So I'm writing a a shorter piece, a novella about that. And I'm using um, flash fiction, which again, I like to challenge myself. And so flash is a challenging genre because you're not writing, you don't have, uh, you know, like 3000 words uh, for a chapter, you know, you have maybe a thousand. And so Mm. it's challenging because a, a lot of the work has to be done between the lines. You know, you have to leave space for the reader to infer the meaning of what you've just said. And, and it's it's extremely challenging. So so I'm excited about it. And so I'm revising that now. And um, there may not be, um, you know, I don't know what's out there in terms of publication for that piece, but I'm sure I'll find someplace. Good. Um, what about authors, um, others that inspired you during the process of writing? Was there anyone that you looked to that gave you inspiration as you began your writing career? Yeah. One of the books I always mention, uh, and there were so many because I really, I, I still, I read um, voraciously. I try to read a couple of novels a week. I just really like being immersed. I'm reading Horse right now by Geraldine Brooks, and it's about um, a, um, a slave jockey. It takes place in Kentucky. And it's a story that flips from the 1850s to the um, uh, 2020s. And so it's it's really an interesting book. But I, I read so many. And one of the books I liked, I originally had this idea that I was going to tell the book from multiple perspectives. And I tried that. And I did, wasn't quite as adept at it as a book. Um, an author named Kent Haruf. And I hope people haven't forgotten about him. He's dead for some time, I think. But he wrote a book called Plain Song. And um, and it, I was just so, uh, I think it actually just inspired me to write a novel, period, because I never really thought, I thought, well, maybe I'll write some short stories. But uh, but then when I read that, I thought, well, maybe I could write a novel because he must, I think he must use five or six different perspectives. And he's writing about a town, a small town. And um, the book is really beautiful and, uh, you know, simply and effectively written from, as I say, something like five or six, even his, the main, one of the main characters, two small boys have their own chapter. And um, like I said, I wasn't, I'm not quite the writer he is, so it didn't really work for me. So (laughs) I ditched that draft and start over, but uh, it was inspiring. So many more great books out there. Excellent. And I love hearing where authors get their inspiration from because it kind of leads us into when we open your book and knowing some of the people that inspire you, we might get a little sense of some of your inspiration kind of blended into how you approach your writing as well. I like that. 
And, you know, another theme of the book that is sort of a sub, sub, sub theme is art. You know, I'm always inadvertently, I think, writing about art because I was an artist and I still hang around uh, with uh, a lot of the artists that I knew in the Midwest. And in fact, I hope to take a trip up there. I have a book event in Chicago, and so I'm excited about being there again. But it, um, Will is has taken off wood carving just out of idleness, I think, and because he he collects like old those old. The, the story takes place on a place at a place called Boneyard Beach, and it that actually is a real island down there. I looked, and um, it's. Uh, you know, the bones, the trees that fall and wash into the ocean and then wash back up on the shore are sort of called, uh, you know, there's a beach called the Boneyard. And so he he goes around and chainsaws those up and does stuff with them. And he, and he actually sells his art once in a while at a little market down in the um, in the town. So, uh, you know, that comes straight from my memories of doing art shows and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> great it's exciting like so the book is launching when is it coming out it is available now from mad okay and okay. it's i believe the official date is the 14th but that kind of doesn't mean anything i have an event here in charlottesville on september 30th and one in chicago on uh, october 26th and other in greensboro north carolina where i worked as a reporter in um, the uh, 1990s in uh, on November the 10th. And so I'm hoping, you know, I'm trying to line up other events. So if any of your listeners have any ideas, maybe they can contact Excellent. me. Yeah, they're listening and we have listeners in all of the places you've mentioned already. So um, yeah, if you're out there listening and you're like, hey, I would love to have an amazing author come into my local bookstore or, you know, do a reading or something. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so, Betty Joyce, where where do people find you online, on social media, as far as following your journey as an author? Where do we go? I have a website, and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and um, I think, oh, and LinkedIn also. There you go. And we'll make sure we have all that in the show notes so everyone can click on there and go straight to you. And before we go, is there any... Words of advice, again, beyond what we've already mentioned, that you could offer to a new author, again, early days in their writing career, that maybe they're just trying to find their voice. What would you say, if their tables were turned and you were listening to this podcast, what do you think you needed to hear early days on when you were starting to write? Well, I would just say write every day and don't give up. And um, just the first... You know, some people like I have even even former students of mine who have published multiple books um, and they just don't give up. You know, if you get rejected uh, when you the time comes to submit it, if you get rejected, lay that down, do another start another project, just keep going. And uh, and by all means, seek editorial advice when you can get it, uh, you know. Um, even if you have to pay something for it, you know, good editors are invaluable because they can, um, you know, sort of uh, keep you going. Not It's not just that they can point out things that you're doing wrong. That's not really the point. What they can do is deepen your connection with the work because they point out things that you probably haven't even noticed about the book that are important that, that um, you may need to lean on more or bring out more or um, in turn, maybe delete because they're not adding anything to the story. So, so some of that advice, if you get, you don't want it too early, but once you get a draft, you know, uh, don't be afraid to show it to people. Nice. I love it. Thank you for making time to be on the podcast. You're an amazing guest, by the way. Oh, I hope you. you do more of this. Thank you. Great conversation. Um, you're very interesting to talk to. And I love, again, your background and your craftiness and all of that and how you bring that into your writing. I just think that's quite unique. So keep going and keep talking about your story and sharing it because uh, I think you, you'd you be a wonderful guest for any podcast. So great. to be on mine, I'm so thankful that you're here. Yeah. Well, you're my first podcast interview. So thank you for Wait being Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Really? No. No, it is. It is really. 
There you go. I would have, I wouldn't have not have known that at all. You are an expert. You're a pro. You did a great job. So, so glad to have you on the podcast. Good to talk to you. Awesome. All right, everyone. All the information will be in the show notes. Please go support Betty Joyce as the book comes out and then you buy your copies. When you buy your copies online, make sure you leave an amazing review as well and let everybody know how great these books are. Thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Glad to have you here. Fighting me. Bye-bye. Thank you for being part of Living the Next Chapter. Hey, look at we're we're having such a great time talking to authors around the world. If you are an author and you would like to be on this very show, I would love to talk to you. Living the next chapter.com, living the next chapter.com, living the next chapter.com is the best way to get in touch with us. There you'll find our social media and blah, 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 la di da, and such. You, author, soon to be author, new author, currently writing your book author, published author, we need you here. The seat's empty, microphone set up, we're waiting for you. Livingthenextchapter.com. We would love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I am talking, I'm talking to you. Yeah, you should be here. See you at livingthenextchapter.com.